All right, thank you. So uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I will be presenting a joint work with Paul Bendit, who's at Duke, and Alex Wagner, who's uh, here, but otherwise at uh, the University of Florida with me. All right. So before my talk, uh, I'd like to advertise uh, the other journal. Uh, so, so we now have uh, uh, two great journals in this subject. And uh, this one does not have topology in the title, uh, but please don't overlook it. If you go to the web page, you'll see topology prominently featured in their, their list of things that they are looking uh, to uh, uh, find papers for. So uh, please submit your best papers either to Schmuel's journal or to this journal. And uh, there are, so there are a number of topologists uh, uh, in the editors, uh, among them, uh, Shine Mukherjee, uh, Dmitry Morozov, and myself. So uh, hopefully you will get good referees for your, your papers. All right. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So for my talk today, uh, just a qu quick outline. I'll start with some motivation for this work. Uh, and uh, then uh, there will be one main example, which I will spend most of the time on. And after we have a sense of what we're trying to do, I'll, I'll give some of the theory underlying uh, this approach. And once we understand that, I can go through some more examples uh, at the end of the talk. All right, so for motivation, I'm going to give uh, motivation from uh, four different directions that we'll see are all connected. And uh, the first one is the, the applied setting, and this is really the one that maybe I'm most interested in personally. And uh, I mean, my main interest is developing topological tools for people who don't really know anything about topology or, or care about topology, uh, but hopefully we can do something for them that they find to be useful. And I think that is already the case, uh, and we have uh, so one great example of this is the persistent homology, or more broadly, topological data analysis. And we can look at data uh, such as here we have brain arteries coming from magnetic resonance images. And we can look at a collection of these from two different clinical populations, and we can extract some sort of summaries uh, and notice that there's differences between two groups. Uh, so. Uh, so I'm not going to say too much about this application. Some of you are familiar with this. This is something called the uh, difference of the average landscapes, but there's different approaches to this. And uh, there's a whole pipeline here that's been very carefully constructed to be stable. Okay, so we have theoretical guarantees saying that if we perturb our data slightly, that this picture at the end will only be perturbed slightly. And then we can have some statistical results saying that this difference is significant. Now, the, so from one point of view, that's great. But then now when we go to the, to the practitioner, the clinician who's working with patients, uh, he sees this, he or she sees this. And, but they, what they really want to do is point to the brain and say, where is this difference between these groups? All right. Uh, if I'm going to have to stick a scalpel in here, I mean, where sh where should I be? Where should I be going? Okay. So so that's the kind of question that I think I would like us as a community to be able to uh, provide some guidance towards. Uh, unfortunately, there's some kind of serious uh, theoretical uh, obstructions to doing that uh, in a kind of a legitimate way. All right. So uh, another, another setting in which we, we see this uh, happening is looking at uh, filtered simplicial complexes. So this is the, the kind of a discrete setting for topological data analysis. We have a, a simplicial complex together with a function on it that gives us a filtration. Uh, so maybe at the back of the room here, you don't recognize that this is a simplicial complex. But from the front, uh, we see that these are, are triangulated surfaces. okay, And they're colored. Uh, so there's a color scale here going, I think, from red to, to blue. And uh, 
So that gives us, we, we can interpret that as giving us real numbers on all of the triangles here. And that gives us something called a filtered simplicial complex. We calculate persistent homology. And uh, so actually, let me explain that in a little more detail using a toy example. So here we have a, a much smaller simplicial complex. And for each of the vertices, edges, and triangles, we have a real number. Uh, and they've been chosen in a way to be compatible uh, so that if we look at sublevel sets of this function, then we also get simplicial complexes. So as we raise the threshold uh, and look at sublevel sets, we get this increasing family of simplicial complexes. And of course, as topologists, we, we see things like this and we want to uh, attach some sort of algebraic invariance. So we, one thing we can do is take homology with coefficients in a field. Uh, that gives us a sequence of vector spaces and linear maps between them. And uh, so one of the main, perhaps the main results of per persistent homology is that there's a nice way of completely summarizing this. Uh, and so we have these two discrete descriptors, which are in some sense equivalent, which is the barcode and the persistence diagram. And they tell us where along this pipeline uh, uh, homology class is born and then how far it persists. Now, so, so the, the, the point I'd like to emphasize is that this information, uh, so we say it's a complete description of the persistence module. Uh, so that's true, but there's, there's important geometric information that we've thrown away. Uh, in this summary, and it's it's so the question that we can ask is for this for this interval here, this persistent homology class, uh, it actually corresponds to some homology class that has uh, various cycle representatives, and we can look at the first part in which that homology class appears, and notice we've attached one simplex at a time, so there's actually a a simplex that we can attach a p particular persistence class to. Uh, so that gives us some nice geometric information. We've got a long bar in this persistence diagram. We can find a corresponding simplex in our simplicial complex. And uh, so this is the kind of thing the uh, geometric information a lot of people would be interested in, but we've, uh, we often throw that away, or we don't tell them about that. And the reason for that is, there's a very good reason, is that that information is unstable. All right, so small perturbations uh, might kind of radically change which of the simplices are responsible for, for persistent homology classes, uh, and whereas this descriptor is stable. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd like to show you the same, the same story in a different setting. So here's the kind of the continuous setting, we have a Morse function on some manifold. And so, so in Morse theory, we, we know that uh, the, so, so, so in Morse theory, we'll lo we look for critical points. And uh, so there's a nice classical theory about how we can reconstruct the manifold using the, the Morse function. Uh, and the, now the persistence point of view ha has one additional ingredient to that story, and it, what it allows us to do is to pair uh, pair things. <laughs> okay, so what do we pair? Uh, we apply persistent homology. So again, if you haven't seen this before, we look at sublevel sets of this Morse function. Uh, so however much of the domain has function values less than some threshold, we look at the singular homology of that. Uh, we raise that threshold, we get an inclusion of subsets, we get an induced map on singular homology, uh, and we can ask about the persistence of homology classes. And uh, so using Morse theory or using persistent homology, we get a pairing of the critical values, and that is stable. So that's how we usually talk about this. Uh, but generically, the critical there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between critical values and critical points. So instead of pairing critical values, we could also be pairing critical points. And uh, so we can do that, but unfortunately that is unstable. 
All right, so let me show you a very simple example of this. So here we have uh, a Morse function on uh, a compact Riemannian manifold, or the circle. Uh, so so we just looking at the height. This function here gives us height. The, height. the heights of points on this loop gives us a function on the circle. And so notice we have uh, two local, two minima, two maxima. And persistent homology can be used to pair these. And so the red squares are paired and the uh, blue triangles are paired. So we have corresponding pairings of critical values over here and critical points on the circle. Now, if I perturb this function slightly, so this is the perturbation here going back and forth. Uh, so I, I want you to notice two things, one of which is that the persistent value pairings don't change at all, uh, but the critical point uh, pairings do. All right, so basically, which of our local minima is the global minima is, 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 is very unstable. All right. Uh, so let, let me move on to the last setting. And this is, uh, this is maybe the statistical point of view. And it kind of combines the previous uh, two settings. So from a statistical point of view, uh, we often think that there's some underlying continuous mathematical object uh, that's the truth, <laughs> maybe. Uh, and, but, and we're interested in understanding things about this truth, but we don't really have access to the truth. The best that we have is some finite sample uh, that we obtain from experiments. So we, we want to kind of construct estimators on this sample that will tell us something about uh, what's really going on underneath. All right, so, so in statistics, I think you really, uh, uh, from one point of view, we kind of combine the discrete and the continuous settings. All right. Okay, so, that, so that's the setup. And I want to work, kind of carefully work through one example. And uh, so let me look at this function here. Uh, so this is a very simple function on the square. It's just a product of sine functions in each coordinate. And uh, to make it a little bit more interesting, I've uh, dampened uh, the values in one of the quadrants. All right, so, so here we have two global minima at m minus one. We have glo one global max at one. Uh, we have another local max here at point one. And then, uh, okay, before I say the next thing, I want to make one other remark, which is that, uh, since this function has been cheerfully, carefully chosen to have value zero on the boundary of the square, there's an induced function on the torus. Okay, so just glue opposite edges of our square like we usually do, and then we get a nice uh, smooth function on a compact manifold. And, it, and then we see that there's gonna be four saddle points. All right, so there's kind of four critical, sorry, six uh, critical points in on this function. All right, now I want to take the, uh, I want th this to be a model for something that we might see in, a, a pl in an applied setting. So I want to work not with the function, but with some uh, data that's been generated from the function. So here we have, uh, I think, some number of points on the torus. Uh, so they've been sampled uh, I, uh, independently from the torus, and uh, we use that function to associate a function value to each of our points. So, so that we have the points on the torus, and the color scale is the same as on the previous slide, uh, giving us some number attached to each of our points. And we're going to turn this into a filtered simplicial complex uh, by taking the del and a triangulation of the torus using the points on the torus, and now we have values on each of the vertices so that induces a filtration on this triangulation. All right, so this is my, this is my data. And uh, let me give you one other view uh, of, of this data. So here uh, we've, 
uh, we've used the coloring or the values to move around the points. So uh, we take each point on the torus and then we move it in the normal direction, uh, a distance proportional to the function value. All right, so the positive points get pushed out. So, so here we have the, the positive points at the global max, they've been pushed out. And then we have the two kind of global minimas, they've been pushed into the torus. So, so this is kind of the region corresponding to the second quadrant. Uh, we've, we've, we've kind of pushed into the torus here, and, and this region's also been pushed in. Yes? We, we push it along the normal vector, yeah. All right. So, so now we're in a, in a place where we can do persistent homology. And so we do that, and we get a persistence diagram. And as uh, so we're looking at degree zero persistent homology. And we get two bars, or two points on the persistence diagram. So both of these are born around minus one, which is coming from our two minima. And uh, one of them dies at, at the saddle points at zero, and the other one uh, goes to the, the global maxima. Now, we're interested in being able to tell somebody where is this global maximum. And so, so let's ask the question, is this maximum coming from the region corresponding to the second quadrant? All right, now, uh, that that's question has a binary answer, uh, or a Boolean answer, and that answer is unstable, okay? Uh, the, the answer to that question will end up being whether or not the global, max, global minimum is either in the second quadrant or the first quadrant, or the fourth quadrant, okay? And it's not the global minimum of the function, which had two of them, but of, the, of, these, ve of these points. All right, so, uh, so with probability one, one of the points will have the smallest value, and it's almost certainly gonna be in the region corresponding to the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant. Uh, all right, so, so it's, it, well, we'll see that having a Boolean uh, valued variable is, uh, well, let me just say that, that that's not going to be something that we're going to be able to do anything with. So the, the, the one main idea is to convert things into a real valued function. So the function that I'm going to use is going to be the length of the longest bar if it is born in the second quadrant uh, and otherwise returns zero. All right, so, so actually, if you look carefully at the data, I've, uh, the answer is, has been color-coordinated for you. There's a, a little red dot here. Uh, so that's actually the global minimum. So that's not, that's, this is a, this is a region corresponding to the fourth quadrant, so this function is going to give us zero. All right, so let me just show this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so this function is a function of the uh, n points, each of which had th three coordinates. So we have a function from R3n into R, and our, our sample, which is the points on the torus, is just some point in this high-dimensional Euclidean space. And since the red dot was in the fourth quadrant, this function returns zero, but the instability is because for close by uh, sample points, this function might have returned something close to two. All right, now the, the in, in a way, the whole story is really this very simple idea. So this is gonna be our solution, uh, which is to randomly perturb this input number uh, and do that m times, repeat the calculation, and average. So, all right, so very simple. Uh, in, in a way, there's kind of nothing to this, but 
uh, I'll, I'll spend, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me show you how the, what happens when we do this. Okay, so this, uh, so if we do this 100 times, we get the longest bar, this is a representation of where the longest bars end up being born. Uh, so, I mean, roughly half of them are in the first, second quadrant, roughly half of them are in the fourth quadrant, and uh, our function is returning the length of these if they're in the appropriate quadrant, otherwise uh, returning zero. And if we do this a thousand times, then we get an average of approximately 1.1 something. Uh, th there's a little subtle point here I'd like to point out is that you may expect that this should converge to one, which was the kind of the average lengths of our two points in the persistence diagram. That's actually not what's going to happen because we are perturbing around a particular sample, uh, which is, e so even though the underlying function was symmetric with respect to the second and the fourth quadrant, though that sample is not. All right, so there's some, that sample has some geometry and, and this number takes into consideration that geometry. Yes. So, so there's always two bars in this example. Sorry, what's? It's the average length of the longest bars. Uh, if they're in the right quadrant that we're interested in. Otherwise, it c we get a contribution of zero. Okay. Uh, in, in, in a way, it's a count of how many of the long bars end up in the right quadrant. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, th that would work just as well. So we could also just take zero or one. Yeah. That would, that would work as well. Uh, this, this function has a little bit more information, but, but that would work as well. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so the procedure is very simple. Uh, it, it gave us an answer. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to try to convince you that uh, that, that is going to be stable and, and maybe show you why that's the case. All right, so first, uh, a couple definitions. Uh, so these are at least the first one we've seen before uh, in Shmuel's talk, I think. Uh, so we say that a function is stable if it is Lipschitz. Okay, so what, what that means is that if we take two different input values, uh, apply our function to them, then the distance, in the, uh, the distance between the outputs is bounded by some constant time. This is the distance between the inputs. All right, so, so if we wiggle our inputs slightly, then we have some control as to how far the outputs are going to move. All right, uh, the second notion is uh, slightly more sophisticated, which is convolution, but probably something that we've seen before at some point. Uh, so this is in uh, RD, we can define convolution. Uh, so whenever this integral is defined, this gives us the definition of convolution. So we convolve two functions, uh, and this gives us a new function which is defined pointwise by this particular integral. All right, uh, so our main idea from the, the theoretical point of view is that we're going to stabilize our unstable functions by convolving them with certain stable functions uh, that are called kernels, uh, somewhat annoyingly to algebraists. Uh, so these are, are just, kernels are just functions. Uh, I mean, often they're given certain properties. But uh, we're going to focus on these three kernels here. Uh, the first one, because it's really simple, and the last two, because they're perhaps the most commonly used ones in practice by statisticians. Uh, so the first is all of them are radially symmetric functions centered at the origin. Uh, the first two have compact support. Uh, so it's just given by a function that's linear in the radius, decreasing, and then when it hits zero, it 
stays at zero. Uh, then we have a kind of a parabolic version of that called the Epinaknikov kernel. And the last one is the, the Gaussian kernel. All right, now there's, there's two other kind of additional ingredients here that I'm going to suppress from the notation. Uh, one of which is it's often helpful to uh, kind of change the support of the first two, kind of change the width of these. So, I mean, we all know from calculus we can scale our, our functions in the, in, in the, in the direction in the, the domain. Uh, so we're going to allow ourselves that flexibility. So statisticians call that bandwidth. So there's a, a parameter in there. Uh, in our paper, we call it alpha. Uh, I'm going to hide that, but that's this that's it, that's part of this story. And then the the other part of the story is that it's typically convenient to normalize these functions so that they have integral one. All right. So there's an extra constant out front here that does that, and I'm going to assume that that's the case. All right, so, so these are our, our, our kind of our main results here. Again, these are not, uh, this is nothing, nothing too deep or complicated. Uh, so if, if H is locally bounded, so remember this is something that's not smooth, but we, we probably need some sort of conditions on it. So if H is locally bounded and we use the, either the triangular kernel or the Epinaknikov kernel, then the convolution is locally Lipschitz. Um, and if H is bounded, then if we convolve with the Gaussian kernel, then we get a Lipschitz function. All right, so we're inheriting the smoothness from the thing that we're convolving with is the uh, short version of the story. All right, so, so let, let me give the procedure that we had earlier in a little bit more detail. Uh, so we start with an unstable function and some observation. We choose a kernel, and now we're going to since that kernel has integral one, we're going to view it as a probability density. Uh, that allows us to sample from the kernel. And uh, we're, we're just going to uh, perturb our input value by these uh, samples from our kernel and reevaluate this function some number of times and then take the average. All right, so that was our procedure. And why does it work, and what does it have to do with convolution? So, so the answer is a, kind of a, one of the central facts of statistics. Uh, so so the, f the following is true by uh, something called the law of large numbers, that this uh, number here, as m increases, is going to converge almost surely to the expectation of a certain random variable. So this, this random variable here uh, takes a random variable x that's distributed according to the probability density k. And if we stick that probability density in here into the function, that gives us another random variable. The expectation of that, uh, just by definition, is the convolution that we're interested in. All right, so that gives us exactly what we want. So that connects the kind of the discrete and the, comp and the continuous versions. All right, now uh, there, there's one point in this procedure that you might uh, point to uh, if, if you're inclined to be unhappy about things that you see in talks in front of you. Uh, and, that, and I've, made a I've made a particular choice here, which is the choice of the kernel k. So, uh, so you may ask, well, this procedure that you're claiming is stabilizing things, is it stable with respect to your choice of k? And the, so the answer is yes. So, uh, so we proved this as well. So uh, if we map the kernel to this convolution, that map itself is, is stable, uh, ag again, meaning Lipschitz. All right, so, so that's the story. We've seen an example. We've seen the theory. Uh, let me show you a few more examples of, of how we can apply this idea. And I'm going to start with uh, actually an example that motivated uh, this research. We, we actually didn't set out to do this. Paul, so Paul was visiting me. And we were, 
we're actually trying to come up with ways in which topological data analysis could give something of use to uh, people studying uh, proteins or uh, RNA in particular. And uh, a lot of these biomolecules are kind of very well understood at the local level, <laughs> but then when you let them free inside an organism, they adopt some very interesting and non-trivial geometry <laughs> that's crucial for their function and is very much not understood. And if you could understand any aspect of this in great detail, you could start a company and sell it to drug manufacturers for hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> or chemists or something easily. <laughs> Okay, so, so this is a big problem. Lots of people are working on this. Uh, and so, so this is one of these pictures. And, and so one thing that we thought we might be able to say, so, so looking at these pictures as a topologist, uh, we, don't see we don't see this. Well, what we see is the holes. <laughs> okay, so we see these holes. Uh, I think sometimes these are called long-range pseudo-knots. They're not maybe really knots, but... Uh, so we thought maybe we could construct some uh, topological persistent homology calculation that would uh, see these holes. Uh, so our, uh, I mean, this is a schematic. This is what things really look like. But I'll, I'll focus on this picture here. Uh, so our idea was to build a s filtered simplicial complex out of this as follows. So the vertices would just be the uh, nucleic acids. and. Uh, there's certain edges that are already given to us. So we would stick in all these edges at time zero. So the vertices and edges that are there would be in time zero. And now we would use the geometry of the ambient space to fill in the other edges at times proportional to their lengths in the ambient metric. All right, so that was our idea. And then, uh, so I mean, just thinking about this, you should see that, I mean, TDA, degree one homology, you should see long bars corresponding to these holes, but uh, I mean, the, the people studying this really want to kind of know some geometry. So uh, in the persistence calculation, as I, as I discussed earlier, the bars are kind of at the end, but in the algorithms, you actually also see kind of where those bars first appear. Uh, so the algorithm will tell you which kind of length here or which edge uh, is responsible for this hole. And, uh, and actually in this, in this figure we see what we kind of wanted it to be is this one here. But I mean, if you just think about this for, for a minute, you'll realize that it's not necessarily going to be this edge that generates the cycle. It'll be whichever one of these is the shortest which is probably going to be some measurement error or something. Uh, and uh, so we're in this situation, right? So the, we're going to get an answer. It's going to be unstable. And what we really want to do is, uh, so applying our algorithm will kind of per permute the locations of all of these vertices. And then we will hopefully pick up all of these pairs as being responsible for this cycle. Shmuel? This circle? <laughs> okay, uh, so, so there's two points of view, and, and, and this methodology or this are, are both, we can use either of them. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on the more simple one, which is just to identify edges that are responsible for homology classes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, I mean, the persistence algorithms will give you that cycle. And I, I'm just as happy to be working with that cycle. I think the story is. All right, you you can you can retranslate everything that I'm saying in your language, and that th that is a, I would I would be very happy to say things exactly that way as well. Yeah. All right, so so we're looking for. 
if, if we're looking for cycles, we can kind of see the shortest one, but then we also might, the, cal the persistence calculation might give us another one. Yeah, so you'll get one of those. And, and, and this procedure will somehow average them. All right, so let, let, me, let me kind of show you that in a toy example, so what happens here. So here we have uh, a very simple planar graph. Uh, so the edges are straight line segments. And we apply the same persistence procedure. So all, all of everything here appears at time zero, and then we start adding in more edges between the vertices according to their distance. Uh, we get, when we look at homology in degree one, we see two homology classes corresponding to the two loops. And we're interested in the big one, uh, and we want to know which cycle or which edge is responsible for this. And uh, initially, it's, I mean, it's going to be one of these two. Uh, and I think I'm close enough to the board that I can tell that this one is slightly shorter. So it's going to be responsible for that, for the big, <laughs> uh, for the big loop, or it's going to be part of the cycle that the first generates that. Uh, uh, so, but now if we add a little bit of noise and repeat, uh, we will see that uh, we end up getting some combination of those two as being responsible. And so what this graph actually tracks is this bandwidth parameter. As we increase the bandwidth, kind of the responsibility for that large cycle gets shared more and more by uh, those two edges or the two corresponding cycles. All right. Okay. Uh, so th this one I'll go through quickly because it's somehow similar to the last one. Uh, here we have an another planar graph. Uh, and we look at homology in degree zero of the sublevel sets. Uh, again, if we want to say where is that homology class born, it'll be born at the global minimum. Uh, we've chosen an example where the minimum is very flat. So this is geometry that uh, we often ignore doing persistent homology, but this is geometry we would like to be able to say something about. And uh, in fact, we do see that if we look a little more carefully at the computations. Uh, so if we introduce a bit of noise and repeat the calculation and average, we'll see that the, the minimum uh, will not always be at three. Some of the times it'll be at two, and some of the times it'll be at four. And kind of the more noise we introduce into the situation, the more uh, evenly it spreads out the credit for that minimum on those spots. Ciao. So, so the height of these, uh, so each of the colors corresponds to, they correspond to the numbers two, three, and four. Uh, I think three is the lowest, so it's the top one. Uh, and I'm not quite close enough to the board to be able to tell if two or four is the second smallest. So this will be the second smallest and the, the biggest one. Uh, and the, the, the top curve here is the sum of the three below it. So you see that kind of the amount that's being distributed stays roughly the same. Pardon? Yes, so this is a, it's a planar graph, yeah, with uh, five vertices, yeah. What uh, Gaussian, I think. All right, so let me look at one last example, and this one's of a bit of, of a different form, and I think this is another good use of the of this approach. Uh, yes? That's just just computational. It's that's just computational, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that example might be simple enough that you can analytically calculate what the what things should converge to. Yeah. Uh, 
All right, so, so this is something else that we often do in, in topological data analysis is that we apply some pre-processing, uh, usually for, for good reasons. So this is uh, one way in which it comes up. Uh, if we sample points on a circle, kind of the favorite simple example, we apply homology in degree one, we see this one beautiful point here far away from the diagonal. Uh, now, if we add any kind of more realistic situations, things it gets a lot harder to see that point. Uh, so even if we just introduce a few outliers in the middle of the circle, if we just apply the kind of simplest construction like the Czech complex or the Vietorius Rips complex, uh, it really, uh, I don't know if destroys the homology is maybe saying it's slightly too strong, but it certainly easily cuts it in half. Okay, so we see it still see our one point here, but it's much closer to the diagonal bef than before, but and that was just by a, a couple points here as outliers. Uh, so one way to get rid of this problem is by thresholding by some density. So we throw up points who don't have near neighbors, for example, or we use a kernel density estimator if we're being a little more s sophisticated. And uh, we set some threshold in which allows us to sweep away those annoying points that are, 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 are bothering us. Now, the trouble with doing that is that this procedure is unstable with respect to the choice of that threshold. All right, so if the threshold is in the wrong spot or the right spot, then uh, if you wiggle it slightly, it'll s that point will pop back in or it'll disappear, and the persistence diagram will jump. So, uh, so from my point of view, uh, I would get rid of this instability with doing a very simple thing. Instead of choosing one threshold, well, I might choose one threshold, but then I would force myself to wiggle that threshold slightly uh, using some kernel, uh, and then do this 100 times or 1,000 times, repeat the experiment, and then the average of that would be stable. All right, so, so, let, let, so this is kind of uh, saying the same thing in a little bit more words. So, uh, so, so many of our computations are unstable with respect to these parameters. And uh, yeah, so let me encode this in mathematics. So the input data we now think of as being some real valued vector. And the parameters we also encode as some vector. And now our computation we can think of as being a function on either Rd R E or R D plus E. And in all th from all three points of view, we can take a convolution and we get stability just from general principles. All right, so, so let me summarize uh, that, I, uh, so from the applied point of view, the main idea is that uh, pr uh, practitioners uh, trying to use our tool as a black box would like to really stay away from things that we're comfortable with and just stick with the data. And the hope is that this uh, procedure is kind of a first step to being able to give them something to point to on their data that is going to be stable. And the, the mathematical difficulty is that the critical points, birth simplices, are generating cycles that we would like to be able to provide people are unstable. Uh, Parameters used in pre-processing are also unstable, but this very simple procedure of perturbing and averaging uh, provides stability. Uh, mathematically, the stability is really coming from convolving with a stable kernel. And if you want to see more details, uh, please check out our preprint on the archive. So thank you very much.